Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley reporting from Washington, D.C. Now we have the big event finally here. The book about Bishop Romney is now on its way to the printer. The manuscript has been finalized. Uh, sorry this took longer than uh, predicted, but we had to keep up with uh, breaking news, including the uh, Time magazine cover story on the Mormon identity, which some of you were kind enough to call to my attention. Thank you for that. Thank you for all the correspondence I get. Often I can't respond to all of it, but m- uh, much of it is highly appreciated. The book entitled Just Too Weird Bishop Romney's Mormon Takeover of America. Just too weird. Bishop Romney's Mormon Takeover of America from Progressive Press. Now, uh, I regard this as a matter of some urgency that this uh, begin to circulate and have the maximum impact obtainable on uh, public opinion at home and abroad even. So therefore, I am appealing to all of the listeners of the show uh, people who have supported my work, uh, sympathetic or interest or uh, whatever it is, please come forward now, buy this book. Go to Progressive Press of California. Progressive Press. Uh, I guess it's progressivepress.com. We'll take check that uh, during one of the breaks. But you dial it up right in the uh, Yahoo or Google or whatever you have. Bing. Progressive Press of California, and it's called... Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney's Mormon Takeover of America, Polygamy, Theocracy, and Subversion. Buy a copy right away. It's going to be available on uh, uh, pay for uh, print, print on demand. So there'll be copies. Um, You've got to think now, looking towards the elections. Um, The proper attitude towards these elections is to be opposed to both candidates and to support the United Front Against Austerity meeting in New York City on October 27th. We'll talk a lot more about that. But the proper attitude is to see the absolute bankruptcy of both candidates. And we've seen it again with the debate this week, as we'll outline in just a minute. I've got two books out about Obama. If you find people that have illusions about Obama... Buy them those books, Obama, the Postmodern Coup, The Making of a Manchurian Candidate, Barack H. Obama, The Unauthorized Biography. That's the whole story of Obama. I think almost nothing has been added by all the Johnny-come-latelys, right? people who come out with the anti-Obama <laughs> literature the second time around uh, are highly suspect, or at least they're, they're suspect of uh, being very much in, uh, in, in a tardy state. But the question now of Romney and the ability to explain what Romney does is rooted in the historical profile of the Mormon Church. This will be the the subject of uh, a couple of segments today. What happened in that debate? What Romney does in general? This Time magazine profile. It is rooted in the history of Mormonism. Above all, the question of duplicity, deception, antinomianism, the idea that the moral law does not apply to the saints. And of course, Romney is a saint. He's a latter-day saint, and he's one of the top ones. This cannot be understood, and the, the um, effortless ease of lying, the effortless ease of deception and dissembling and prevarication uh, by Romney it makes him one of the most accomplished liars. People have talked about Romney as a flip-flopper. Well, what does that mean? Flip-flopping means lying. I believe this now. I always have. We'll give you some historical examples. Rooted in Mormonism, therefore you've got to consult the relevant historical record, and I give it to you all in one place. The Joseph Smith story, the question of the secession of Utah, secession of Utah territory, which is just off the charts, right? can't be done by any stretch of the imagination. 1857 to 1858, with the Mountain Meadows Massacre, which seems to be the the glue that holds together a significant part of the Romney machine today with people like Senator Lee and Governor Levitt and others. And then, of course, Brigham Young's waiting game during the Civil War when he was awaiting the opportunity to stab the United States in the back. If the British 
had attacked through Canada, if the French had attacked through Mexico, uh, Brigham Young would have been there stabbing the United States in the back. So there it is, duplicity, treachery, subversion. And uh, the hyper-patriotic rhetoric of Romney, his books, and all this stuff cannot hide decades and decades, practically a century, of open rebellion, subversion, scorn for the laws of the United States, above all polygamy, the racism, the misogynism, and all the rest of this. This has got to be put forward. The Democratic Party is too weak. Other people lack the necessary historical uh, depth. So here it is for you. Just too weird. Bishop Romney's Mormon takeover of America, polygamy, theocracy, subversion. Go right now to Progressive Press. Buy a copy. Now, think about people. If you have people who have illusions about Romney, we've just done Obama, so now let's go on to Romney. People who think that Romney is a fine man need to read this book. People who don't know the story of polygamy need to read this book. Remember, the Romney family chose polygamy over patriotism. When they had a choice between the United States on the one hand and polygamy on the other, they chose polygamy. They went to Mexico. They had no plans to come back. They were forced to come back by Pancho Villa and his revolutionary forces. Otherwise, they would have been in Mexico. We would have been, I guess, better off. Right? There'd be no Romneys back here in the United States. They'd be down in Mexico. And the reason was that the, uh, the anti-polygamy uh, campaign in Mexico was uh, was attenuated. It wasn't wasn't uh, as uh, vigorous as the one going on in post Civil War America. Then there's the little matter of racism that the Time magazine manages to sweep under the under the covers uh, under the carpet completely. Uh, and we'll go through the, the the timeline on that. But the basic idea is up until 1978, if you were black, you could not be a full member of the Mormon Church. You could not come to the priesthood, and the priesthood is a fairly low grade. Um, I would think that the possible comparison would be confirmation in Christianity, right? something that might happen to you when you're an adolescent, more or less, or an early adolescent. That is essentially getting to the priesthood in Mormon, and they, they, maybe the, the comparison is not one-to-one, but you get the idea. So you can't really become a full-fledged Mormon if you're black until 1978. And that means that until 30 years ago, one-third of a century ago, if you were a racist and you were looking for a lily-white congregation with no black faces, the one church that could guarantee you that was Mormonism. So this meant that the Mormon church became loaded with racists and reactionaries more than it had been. I think the time between... 1964 and 1978 is when they had a tremendous influx of racists and reactionaries. Now, of course, the Mia Love exercise is designed to hide that, but we're not going to be fooled. That is tokenism in the worst uh, form. So uh, women, of course, are not going to be interested in uh, polygamy. I hope nobody would be interested in polygamy, but uh, unfortunately it turns out some are. But certainly women uh, faced by this are horrified, and uh, that is uh, deeply rooted. The, uh, according to my uh, understanding, the last prophet, the last boss, top president of the Mormon Church, who lived in polygamy, uh, died in 1945. I think it's, it's Heber Grant. Uh, he, was, he, was, he had polygamous marriages that had been contracted before the uh, the ban, or shortly after the ban, uh, in 1890. So there he was. Um, polygamy is, is simply there. And we have these quotes from Senator Hatch, the Mormon, from Senator Lee, the Mormon, and from Romney, that polygamy is probably covered by religious freedom. I'm sorry it's not. The twin relics of barbarism, polygamy, and slavery have no place in the United States. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Topley here in Washington, D.C. Once again, my new book, Book Length Study, it's about 250 to 260 pages. Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney's Mormon Takeover of America, Polygamy, Theocracy, Subversion. Go to Progressive Press. Progressive Press. Uh, You can get it on Progressive Press right now faster than uh, any other way. 
It's ProgressivePress.com, ProgressivePress.com, Just Too Weird. Order copies now. They are available. Uh, this will be shipping next week. That is to say it's the 5th of October right now. So the copies will begin going out uh, next week, starting um, around Columbus Day. The week of Columbus Day will be the time for the state to speak. So think about uh, people that you want to uh, educate about the historical reality of what Romney represents, because this has hardly been touched. And I'm afraid the Time magazine um, cover raised the question, but didn't really provide any answers. Now let's look... Uh, illustrate what I'm what I'm talking about why is this book so essential let's look at this debate that we've just had uh, first of all like the debate is a farce as I tried to argue on the Twitter feed the farce is one thing the theater that you get to see is one thing the reality which we'll get to in a minute is that the austerity ghouls are at work the crapo commission gosh another another Mormon another ally of uh, of Romney is one of the dominant people on this commission Senator Mike Crapo of Idaho. Crapo, Chambliss, the scoundrel, Coburn, the reactionary, Alexander, the, the uh, prison industrial complex man, Warner of Virginia, Durbin, the, uh, what can we say, the Illinois bipartisan combine, uh, Bennett, the Democrat of Colorado, Conrad of, of um, North Dakota, I guess it is, uh, and a couple of more, Th they are uh, essentially planning ways to skin you alive with killer austerity. It's the Halloween season. The austerity ghouls are at work. So while the poor public is fixated on the debate between Romney and uh, Obama, the austerity ghouls are at work behind the scenes. But let's, look, let's just look at the farce, right, because we've got to account for for the behavior of Romney, and it, it shows the problem that we've got. So uh, what we have in this debate, the Romney-Obama uh, debate, a liar and a coward. Romney, the liar. Obama, the coward. Romney was lying a blue streak. It was breathtaking. In the first 15 minutes of that debate, he basically reinvented himself. It was a different person. Was it an imposter? Completely different. Uh... $5 trillion tax cut for the rich? What? Me? No. I'll never have a $5 trillion tax cut for the rich. What? Soak the middle class? Gouge them to pay for tax cuts for the rich? No, I wouldn't do that. So, Romney, what is he? He's a shapeshifter. He's <laughs> the artful dodger. He's Proteus. He takes any form he wants. Uh, he's Romney... The liar. Now, everybody knows that he's a flip-flopper. Flip-flopper means you're a liar. You say, I never believed that. I've always believed what I'm telling you right now today. Hmm. Gordon Gecko, <laughs> uh, the zinger king, uh, but the shapeshifter, the artful dodger, Romney the liar, king of the flip-floppers. He's raised flip-flopping to a high art. The interesting thing about Romney, though, is how can he lie with such a plumb, how can it be so smooth, so effortless, so lacking in friction? There's no conscience, there are no qualms. The man is an antinomian, an antinomian. He believes that the moral law, any kind, Ten Commandments, whatever you want, does not apply to him. Where does this come from? It comes from Mormon theology. It's deeply rooted. Uh, read this book. Uh, just too weird, Bishop Romney's Mormon takeover of America, you will find that not only was Joseph Smith an antinomian in the sense that he did not believe that any Ten Commandments applied to him, but his mother was an antinomian. She believed in the primacy of one's own personal religious experience, and that trumps all the law and the prophets, the Ten Commandments, whatever it is, the public code, doesn't matter, you have to live out what the inner voice is telling you. Now, uh, just in terms of the situating antinomianism, it's in, in Christianity, of course, it's a heresy to say that the end is near, we can do what we want. Or, I'm a saint, I'm saved, I can do what I want. There are forms of Calvinism that get very close to this idea. I know that I am saved, and therefore whatever I do is going to be okay. 
no. Uh, another one is, once the, uh, the end time is imminent, that means the moral law is suspended. No, no, no. The denomination that took this further, perhaps, in the 1600s in England was the Quakers. The early Quakers, the pre-clampdown uh, Quakers said, well, you have an inner voice, you have extra-scriptural uh, revelation that's given to you. Doesn't matter what the Ten Commandments say about killing, stealing, adultery, and all the rest. You can do what you want. If God tells you that it's not a sin for you, go ahead and do it. Now, of course, the voice that you're hearing is uh, probably not that uh, of uh, coming from on high, but from some other place. So you're getting these messages saying, go ahead and do it, go for it, and uh, this is inherently unreliable. The solution that the Quakers had to this was to de-emphasize the inner light and to uh, counterpose the sense of the meeting. In other words, the elders. The elders run the meeting, and you have to conform to the consensus of the meeting. So that's what happens in, in Quakerism, right? You get eldered. They come and say, you've got to stop what you're doing. Now, that is uh, whatever it is. In the case of Mormonism, it's, of course, much more, uh, much more of an interference. We've just had this case of uh, some Mormon writers, this guy Tweed, of the, uh, I guess it's Mormon Think, and you can follow this on Mormon Curtain, who was threatened with excommunication last weekend, and the threat of excommunication hangs over him even now. He may have an excommunication hearing at any time. Because he revealed secrets of the temple ritual, the liturgy, the so-called endowment, and he also cast dispersions on uh, on Romney. So uh, that's obviously an, a desire to chill <coughs> such people, because lo lots of Mormons certainly uh, can see through Romney, right? And um, this is something that is held together by uh, various forms of repression and intimidation. Uh, it was like in the 1850s, right, the whole literature around the world that grew up around this idea of escape from Utah, right, to get out from under Brigham Young, and how could you do that? Before the railroad, it wasn't so easy, uh, and uh, they would come after you if you tried to get away, uh, and we have those cases documented in the book. So antinomianism arises in Judaism with Sabbatai Zvi, Shabtai Zevi, uh, Sabbatai Zevi or Shabtai Zvi, 1666. He comes in with the same thing. He tells the, the, the uh, learned rabbis of Prague and other places, go wild because I'm the Messiah and everything is suspended, and I'm telling you. Bad idea, bad idea. We'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Once again, it's uh, the afternoon of uh, Friday, October 5th. 2012, and we're announcing the uh, imminent chipping of just too weird Bishop Romney's Mormon takeover of America. And the relevance is when you see Romney in that debate lying with that kind of ease and uh, seamless uh, uh, continuity, never missing a beat. You see, other people, other people, when they lie, they get verklempt, right? They get uh, tied up because they, they know they're lying, and they have uh, all kinds of things going on, right? This is how lie detectors work. But uh, it's, it's very possible that on Romney, a lie detector wouldn't work because there's no, uh, there's no guilt. There's nothing. So where, do, where does he get this? Well, let's look at the relation of the Mormon church to polygamy. Let's just pick a, a leading example. It's not exactly clear when Joseph Smith began with polygamy, right? He's thought to have racked up between 50 and 84 wives. Actually, the, the conservative institutional count is in the 30s, the moderate count is in the 50s, and the more extreme count is in the 80s. Uh, so Joseph Smith, uh, sometime around 1830, started with polygamy, which was secret. And it was secret. It was his secret for a while, and then, of course, the the evidence of his celestial attentions became impossible to conceal, uh, as one writer puts it. And then it had to come out, but only in the in the small circle of the Mormon uh, leadership. So, for a lot of this time, it was a privilege of the of the elite, of the top dogs, of people like Parley P. Pratt, the great great grandfather of uh, Mitt Romney. But from let's say from 1830 or thereabouts until 1852. 
the Mormon rule was practice polygamy, do polygamy, live in polygamy, but deny it. And deny it indignantly. What? How dare you? What a slander. Us, polygamy? Never, never, never. Uh, so whatever you, you can think about tensions from lying, right, the bad feeling, bad conscience of, of lying in public about something that, you're, that you've elevated to an article of faith, literally, because it's an article of faith, uh, and was already then on the inside, that you can't get into heaven if you don't uh, have more than one wife. So in 1852, it changes, and Brigham Young says, surprise, we've been practicing polygamy the whole time. 22 years, all those vehement denials, right? It's like Nixon, Nixon the Quaker, uh, antinomian. But Nixon can come out and say, or his spokesman can come out and say, all previous statements are inoperative. So that's what Brigham Young does in 1852. All previous statements are inoperative. We are polygamy. Polygamy is us. We've been doing it. We'll continue to do it. We have to do it. God told us to do it. Can't get into heaven without it. So if you want polygamy, come to me, come to Salt Lake City, and uh, polygamy will be the order of the day. Now, this is not a matter of a demographic crisis. Right? The, uh, the story we get from Glenn Beck and the story we get from John Meacham here in the Time Magazine cover story about the Mormons we see here, uh, let's see, the uh, explanation is that they wanted to uh, generate more, uh, more people, more Mormons, so they had, they had to turn to polygamy. This is a fallacy. The general rule in Mormondom is that there were uh, more men than women. So the idea, there are already more men than women. If one man monopolizes 5, 10, 15, 20 women... That's going to create a permanent class of bachelors who are embittered because they have no way of getting into heaven. And you can see that again. You go to uh, Colorado City, Arizona, or Hillsdale, Utah. The young men who don't make it to polygamy are kicked out. They're hounded. And that's what Warren Jeffs did, and that's what uh, Brigham Young did at different times. Here's what John Meacham writes in Time magazine of this week. Uh... Moving westward, the church grew more pragmatic over time, seeking to make peace with the broader world, to preserve freedom for Mormons to live as they wished. Yeah, it's for some Mormons to live as they wished, not the young men, not women, and particularly not older women who were often dumped. Even polygamy, even polygamy, writes John Meacham, the most notorious of Mormon practices, was limited to practical concerns. Practical. It was because <clears throat> the church needed new members. And they, they, they back up Romney. As Romney told 60 Minutes in 2007, referring to his great-grandfather, Miles Romney, quote, they were trying to build a generation out there in the desert, and so he took additional wives as he was told to do. This is false. This is not true. This, the historical record does not back that up, because the polygamy started in the 1830s. The pol there's pretty good evidence that the polygamy started before they were driven out of anywhere, right, when they were still in the <coughs> Palmyra, Rochester, New York, burned-over area. It started, uh, because, as, jo as uh, Joseph Smith said, whenever he saw a pretty woman, he had to pray for grace. So he did it as a matter of impulse. With Brigham Young, it's an organizational strategy. The idea is I want you to come to Salt Lake City, meaning the desert, right? meaning the wilderness. And once you get here, you're not going to like it, so I want to keep you here. And I want to offer you something that you will like, polygamy, and once you're polygamous, you have no other place to go. You can't start a polygamous family here and then go to San Francisco or Chicago or St. Louis or anywhere like this. You can't. You've got to stay here. So polygamy, the way Brigham Young saw it, was a way to bind people, to nail them down so they could not get out of this uh, paradise of Deseret. So, what are we left with? From 1830 to 1852, practice polygamy, deny it indignantly. From 1852 to 1890, practice it and proclaim it and demand, say, this is my constitutional right. You can't stop me. 
the First Amendment, freedom of religion, my religion says polygamy, uh, therefore I get to practice it. Now, under Brigham Young, the religion also includes human sacrifice, right? Blood atonement. Uh, blood atonement for the United States, above all. Blood atonement for people who are somehow linked to the killing of Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith. Uh, human sacrifice. Now, somebody could say, human sacrifice, as Brigham Young did. Human sacrifice is part of my religion. You can't stop me. And here, here the, the question is posed, right? The religions come forward with competing absolute claims. And these, unfortunately, or whatever, because of the nature of human life, have got to be subjected to the rules of the civil magistrate. That religion is belief, but once it gets to overt acts, those overt acts have got to be classified and judged according to public law, not according to the internal belief system of anybody's religion. Other than if you don't have that, you have civil war. You have, you have chaos. You have uh, the, the French wars of religion from about 1560 to uh, the end of that century till almost 1600. You've got chaos going on. That's where the politique come forward, and that is where the principle that I've just uh, developed uh, comes from. So from 1852 to 1890, practice and proclaim and say that this is, this is constitu- it's a constitutional right. And indeed, try to get admitted as a state so that you'll have even more ability to impose polygamy. However, the Moral Act of uh, the Civil War period, 1862, bans polygamy, and it sets up this machinery similar to the RICO statute that says if organizations promote polygamy, they can be expropriated, their property, their wealth, their riches can be taken away. So it's like RICO, right? The, 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 the loot can be seized. Well, uh, it took a while, right? The Poland Act, it took Supreme Court decisions that, that, was, that the, uh, the ban on polygamy was, was legal and constitutional. Uh, in 1890, the Mormon Church is facing the expropriation of everything. And at that point, there's a new revelation that comes to the, uh, the first president saying, okay, we're told now to drop polygamy, although we keep it for heaven. Drop it now, have it later in heaven. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. We're reminding you of two things. October 27th, New York City, 56 Walker Street from noon to 6 p.m. The United Front Against Austerity will meet, convene, found, whatever you want to call it. We will be there, and you should be there, too. Uh, if you didn't like that debate, if you're disgusted by the choice between a liar, Romney, and a coward, Obama, who's also a liar, but, uh, you know, we've got to... We've got to use the ruling passion, I guess. Every man in his humor, as Ben Johnson would say, a lot of they combine many of the deadlies, but you've got to pick the, big, you know, the one that they like most at any given time. Uh, if you're disgusted by that choice, if you find that the choice between Romney and Obama is an insult to your intelligence and uh, absolutely no future for the United States, be there in New York on October 27th Noon to 6, 56 Walker Street, Tribeca, right by Canal Street. Um, there's a call up uh, that I've put on, the, uh, on my website, tarpley.net, tarpley.net. And uh, news about this will also come through Twitter feed, Webster G. Tarpley on uh, Twitter, as it did. I live blogged the, uh, the debate, right, P- calling attention to the cascade of lies, right, in the first 10 or 15 minutes by the antinomian Romney, the guy who says, I'm a saint, I'm a Latter-day Saint, moral law does not apply to me. He would be a bigger antinomian than Nixon. Because with Nixon, the, uh, the Quakers, of course, starting, you know, starting in, the, in the 1600s already, as I said before, clamped down. They said, you've got you to gotta cool it with the, uh, with the inner light and the inner voice, and you've got to go with the sense of the meeting. Now, the problem is, as it shows with Nixon, is that these cultural tendencies run very deep. And in the case of Mormonism, since this is a compact, well-organized, sectarian uh, uh, cult, with a sect with a bitter uh, uh, narrative of persecution, right? Cahier de doléance, gravamina, right? Their complaints. They have a liturgy of complaints, a gospel of complaints about what the United States did to them. Uh, this is much more heavily inculcated than it would be, say, among a mo- in a modern uh, 
Quaker or something like this. So just, just to wrap up on polygamy, from 1830 to 1852, practice polygamy in secret, especially at the upper levels, but deny it. 1852 to 1890, polygamy for everybody, not just the elite in the Mormon church, but for the poor farmers of southern Utah, right? The picture that we have is the farmer, the Mormon farmer, the polygamist is the uh, overseer, He's got five or six wives. Those are the field hands. They do the work. The man directs the women. Uh, how about that? Um, so uh, that's uh, how it became a mass phenomenon, and that's where it still exists today. In those areas of southern Utah, where the Romney family also lived, because they went to St. George, Utah, to help Brigham Young build one of his uh, pleasure palaces there, right? one of his <laughs> multiple uh, selled uh, polygamous uh, houses. So 1890, they were facing a decree, they were facing you know, judge, court judgments based on, uh, on the Moral Act, that they were going to be expropriated if they continued to promote polygamy. So in 1890, the revelation came down, time to drop polygamy, at least on Earth, right, in this life, apparently, uh, except that that did not end it. And we see that in the, in the, in the Romney family, they were in Mexico by that time, and they continued to contract the uh, polygamous marriages. The, 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 uh, the technicality they used was this. The 1890 decree says, don't practice polygamy if it's against the law of the land, understood being where you are. So if you're in the United States and polygamy is banned, you've got to stop it. But maybe you're someplace else, right? I don't know. Maybe you're in the Ottoman Empire. Who knows? There you can do it. So the idea was if you went to Mexico, this was not so much of an issue in Mexico. Uh, you, could, you could get by. I have to say I have not been able to, uh, to learn too much about the, the way that the Mexican government handled the issue of polygamy. But the fact is some Mormons went to Mexico. Others went to Canada. There's a, there's a, a community up there that started off as polygamous with, uh, with Pratt's and others uh, coming from there. So... Uh, that's the way in which polygamy continued. And remember, the Romneys had this polygamous colony, Colonia Juarez, Mexico, until about 1912 when Pancho Villa came through and drove them out. So we can then say from 1890 to about 1945, it's a phenomenon of practice it to some extent, Certain Mormons were practicing polygamy, but by now they're denying it. So 1830 to 1852, practice and deny. 1852 to 1890, practice and proclaim. 1890 to 1945, practice, although on a narrower basis and concealed, and deny it. And as I say, these you know, marriages last a long time. And as far as I can see, the last head of the Mormon church who had polygamous wives... He passed away in 1945. After 1945, what do we have? Well, this we don't know so much about. We know that there's the fundamentalist LDS down there with Warren Jeffs on the southern Utah to Arizona border, and they're practicing it, right? You find, uh, look, in, look in my book, uh, Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney's Mormon Takeover America. How'd you like to live in Colorado City, uh, Arizona, where the Mayor is a polygamist. The chief, uh, the fire chief is a polygamist. The judges are polygamists, and the uh, the police chief is a polygamist. Not much chance. And that's where, when uh, when Orrin Hatch goes down there campaigning, he said, "Oh, I know so many people in Hillsdale, Utah, the Twin City, uh, across the border, and they ha they ha they share the police department in common with the Arizona ones." Uh, Orrin Hatch says, "Oh, I think you know, I some of the best people are." Are polygamists and big sis Janet Napolitano from Arizona. Of course, there's a big story about a Janet Napolitano and people like this who never lifted a finger against these polygamists. Nor did Bruce Babbitt, who then went on to the Clinton cabinet. Nor did Fife Symington. There's a whole story about governors of Arizona, right? There's a, a, a certain uh, there's a more open complicity in high places on the Arizona side than even on the Utah side. So you get the idea. Let's just take racism. It's another story. Uh, can blacks be a member of the church? Now, starting, the Book of Mormon has racist prejudice in it. 
but it, it's, it, it's, it's more that the Lamanites, anybody with brown or black skin, is descended from those evil angels that wouldn't support the, uh, the Mormon Jesus in the struggle uh, on the planet Kolob. But that, is, that, that doesn't necessarily rule you out if you're black. The way that changed then was the Book of Abraham, uh, somewhat later, and that's where we get the argument that if you're descendant of uh, Ham, I guess it is, who's black, then uh, you can't be a priest. So uh, this is thought to have been dictated uh, by uh, the expansion of the Mormon Church into the southern states and Joseph Smith's desire to recruit wealthy southerners who might also be slaveholders. So they would object to coexisting in a co congregation with uh, black people. So it's another good example. It's a purely pragmatic uh, change based on expediency, but it presents itself as being the eternal word of God. In other words, it, it doesn't say, hey man, the heat is on, uh, or we better drop polygamy, or we can recruit like mad in the South if we just, uh, if we just go a little bit more racist uh, than we are, right? Follow the, the path of white supremacy a little bit further. Uh, it's always presented as God talked to the first president last night, and this is now the eternal word. Uh, the problem with that is uh, it's always changing. How can the metaphysical realities of the world be in such flux? And then 1978, 1978, we have a new revelation that uh, you can be black and join the Mormon priesthood, but this is only, again, at that level of regulations. It doesn't change what's in the Book of Mormon and, above all, what's in the Book of Abraham. The Book of Abraham, of course, is this... Uh, this fraud, right, that, that Joseph Smith got a hold of a, a Egyptian burial document, and then he said he was translating. He couldn't translate it, and he made it into a whole big story, which has no relation to the, uh, the uh, embalming instructions, really, that are in the original document. All right, back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, Webster Tarp here in Washington, D.C. Two important things you should do. During the election campaign, uh, during the time between now and the presidential election, first is prepare to attend the United Front Against Austerity, October 27th, New York City, 56 Walker Street, noon to 6. That will be a strategy meeting, uh, discussion, program organization, leadership, and, uh, and everything else needed to provide an alternative. You watch that debate, the liar Romney, the coward Obama, this is no choice. This, uh, this is absolutely unacceptable. It's time for an alternative to that at any level that we can get it. The other thing you should do, buy a copy, order a copy from Progressive Press of Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney's Mormon Takeover of America, Polygamy, Theocracy, and Subversion and going on with a couple of other things about the contents of this. Uh, the, what we've discovered now, the pattern of the Mormon Church is uh, radical changes in doctrine that are really not, a, that, no, they're not a, acknowledged or justified in any um, rational way, but always, oh, a new revelation has popped up, but the new revelation always seems to look suspiciously pragmatic. And this is now the theme of this... Um, Time Magazine cover story, The Mormon Identity, you've seen it, it's uh, the Mormon Identity with, uh, with the equivalent of a stained glass, stained glass window on the uh, cover by John Meacham, and uh, what do we find? The Mormon in Mitt, uh, the Mor Romney's faith, Mormon faith, is central to his life and may be critical to any comeback. Uh, what the history of Mormonism tells us about his vision, values, and pragmatism. And pragmatism is their uh, nice uh, euphemism, their nice name, for this <laughs> question about flip-flopping, lying, dissembling, uh, and all the rest. By John Meacham, the Mormon in Mitt. Now, the method here is, is sound. This is the right method. His faith is central to his life. The history of Mormonism tells us much about Romney's vision, values, and if you want pragmatism or unprincipled uh, uh, opportunism, I guess would be a better 
word. And in religion, the constant shifting of unprincipled opportunism is is not good, right? Religion thrives obviously on on tradition. So he's picked his tradition, and I'm sorry, it's the wrong tradition for the United States. The faith that he loves, the faith of his fathers, is not what we need because of these little problems, right? Polygamy, misogyny, racism, and subversion. Now, here's the thing. Meacham starts his article quoting, this is Time Magazine this week, Meacham's article, he quotes Marion G. Romney. Marion G. Romney, member of the Mormon elite, cousin of former Michigan Governor George Romney, and cousin, I don't know how many times removed, of Mitt Romney. And this is a sermon called America's Destiny. When you hear this kind of stuff, the messianic utopian America's Destiny, this is where you want to watch out. Now, of course, the irony here is that uh, the Mormons would have been saying at an earlier time, right, a hundred years earlier, it would have been, the destiny of those damned Gentiles, the destiny of those damned Americans. Now it's become hyper-patriotic, and this is another interesting pragmatic uh, uh, adaptation. So we're told, on the eve of America's bicentennial in 1976, that uh, Marion Romney rose to speak at the biannual general conference of the saints in Salt Lake City. Can we maintain our basic freedoms, peace, and prosperity for another 200 years? The answer is yes, if we shall individually repent and conform to the laws of the God of this land, who is Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible for the Mormons is accepted, but any specific thing in the Bible can be dispensed with. In other words, the the rule from Joseph Smith is, the Bible is the word, word of God, as long as it's translated correctly. <laughs> Therefore, anything you don't like in the Bible, you say, wait a minute, that's corrupt. That's, that's uh, an interpolation, right? Some, some Jesuit put that in there, right? That's not authentic, and so forth. So, then here's the thing, and I want you to remember George W. Bush. We actually we have an interesting quote from George W. Bush in the paper this week. Let's see if I can quickly find it. Uh, remember the kind of religious messianic stuff. Here it is, yesterday's Washington Post. Thursday, October 4th, Washington Post. Richard Cohen, and this is about the chances for war in the Middle East, but here's, here's what George W. Bush, an antinomian of his own kind, uh, told Jacques Chirac, president of France, in 2003. Here's Bush talking. This confrontation is willed by God who wants us to use this conflict to erase his people's enemies before a new age begins, Bush told a bewildered French president, Jacques Chirac. For some reason, Chirac thought Bush sounded like a fanatic. Yeah, and he was a fanatic, and he couched it in religious terms. Now, we've seen this combination of a Christian fundamentalist, Bush, uh, of limited mental powers, and a bunch of these wily neocons around him, leading him by the nose. Okay, and we've seen it even in uh, Oliver Stone's uh, movie about uh, W. Now, what's the story? We have not a Christian this time, but a Mormon, Romney, with his messianic utopian vision, and another group of wily neocons, except this time the neocons have got a gripe. They've got an axe to grind. They say, oh, our faction has been slandered. We've been repudiated. Bush, uh, the elder, Bush the Younger, left with 22%. We've got to vindicate the honor of our neocon faction. Uh, and that's what's going to be uh, coming at you through Romney. But here's the thing now. How might uh, Romney uh, 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 go after this? Right? You can see Bush is basically saying to destroy the enemies of Israel is the, is the task of the United States. How would Romney see it? It's, it's similar, but it's, in some ways it's worse. Uh, the vision, and we're back to Meacham now in Time magazine, the vision that greatly expands the traditional Protestant view of America as the new promised land. So overcorrecting for their earlier fanaticism against the United States, uh, they now have, uh, like other groups, right, um, the groups that didn't support the Union during the Civil War then had to overcompensate 
after that, right, in, at least in the northern states, the vision has now become more extreme with the Mormons than it even is with the American Protestants. According to Mormon founder Joseph Smith, the U.S. is the terrestrial home of the Garden of Eden and the place where a resurrected Jesus appeared to restore the gospel and where he will come again in Jackson County, Missouri. Jackson County, Missouri. Uh, Matthew Bowman, historian of Mormonism at uh, Hampton Sydney College, says, What is largely metaphorical for many Protestants is literal for many Mormons. Watch out. At Brigham Young University, Marion Romney, back in 1975-76, spoke of, and this is the heart of the matter, America's, quote, final great and glorious destiny. Here Zion is to be established and the new Jerusalem is to be built. From here the law of God shall go forth to all nations. Now look at that. From here the law of God shall go forth to all nations, says this cousin of George Romney and Mitt Romney. Now, if you compare that to Bush in 2003, the Mormon version is more extreme, because it's not simply, we'll destroy the leading Arab state, or we'll destroy the main threat that we can see to the Israelis. This is now, the law of God shall go forth to all nations. Now, where might that come from? Again, looking in my book, Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney's Mormon Takeover of the United States, Polygamy, Theocracy, and Subversion. It comes from the White Horse Prophecy of Joseph Smith, and we're going to look at that now in just a minute here on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, Webster Tarpley in Washington, D.C. So we're just looking at the current uh, Time Magazine cover story on the Mormon identity, Mitt Romney, and we're reading this chilling, I think really scary, uh, prophecy by Marion Romney back in 1975, America's Final Destiny. This is going to be Zion and the New Jerusalem, okay, in Missouri. But from here the law of God shall go forth to all nations. Uh, this does not look so good. This looks more extreme. This is basically a declaration of war against every sovereign state. That's the equivalent of the caliphate, right? What al-Qaeda does with the caliphate, this is the idea of a universal theocracy. In this case, it's a universal Mormon theocracy. Al-Qaeda goes for a universal Islamist, Salafist theocracy. Both are bad. We don't want it. Uh, this is not the point. Uh, and to say, we support the Constitution, but the law of God is going to prevail, sorry, that does not work because uh, your view of the law of God is not the next guy's version. And you've got the Book of Mormon, the other guy has some other book. This is the road that we must turn away from. And now, the White Horse prophecy, because that's what underlies this, right? The, the main messianic utopian uh, point of the uh, Mormon church is uh, what's going to happen, and this is what Joseph Smith is uh, telling these guys in 1843 and 1844, Here's, I'll just give you a quote from it. Quote, quoting from the White Horse Prophecy, Joseph Smith talking, the last great struggle that Zion, meaning the Mormon theocracy, will ever have to contend with will be when the whole of America will be made the Zion of God. That means no more earthly rule, but the, the dictatorship of Joseph Smith, vicar of, uh, of Moroni on earth, or Kolob on earth. Those opposing will be called Gog and Magog, right? Revelation. The nations of the earth will be led by the Russian Tsar. The Russian Tsar. And his power will be great, but all opposition will be overcome, and this land will be the Zion of our God. Amen. Joseph Smith. Whoa. That's uh, this amazing remark by Romney. Russia is the main strategic foe of the United States. Uh, this is a recipe for the apocalypse. We don't want it. People think that they, they acquire merits in heaven by bringing on the end of the world. Guess again. So uh, you get the idea. And this is, these are only some examples of what we have in the book. I would call especially attention the idea that the Mormons were fostered, I don't know about exactly created, although 
it doesn't take long before the intelligence division of the British East India Company is there. The charismatic Pentecostalists of uh, Edward Irving through Reverend Hewitt coming to meet Joseph Smith in 1835, and after that, the massive recruitment, the massive transfer of uh, religious uh, enthusiasts, adepts, in England and Scotland and Wales into the ranks of Mormondom. It's a church that was built on the foundation of recruiting in the British Isles. And this, I'm sorry, you cannot do without the permission and the support of the British elite. Otherwise, you would have had the church courts of the, uh, of the Episcopalian uh, Anglican Church and even Methodists coming, coming after you, as happened to a very, very limited extent. So take a look at the unpublished essay by Thomas Carlyle on the Mormons. This is not on the Internet anywhere. This is from um, the Carlyle Studies Annual, 1995. Clyde de, de Reals is the, uh, the, was the, scholar, the principal scholar of Carlyle. Carlyle is a fascist or proto-fascist, and Carlyle celebrates Brigham Young saying that's the prototype of what we need to get rid of democracy. We need theocratic, charismatic rulers like Brigham Young, who can be dictatorial and work from a mass consensus. Uh, remember, uh, Carlyle, in the last days in the bunker in Berlin, Hitler and Goebbels were reading Carlyle's book on Frederick the Great, saying we're going to get the same miracle of the House of Hohenzollern that saved him is going to come and save us. You could say Thomas Carlyle, a long time after he died, prolonged the Second World War by several months got lots and lots of people, hundreds of thousands of people killed. So that's the guy who tells you that, that Brigham Young is, is the great prototype. And didn't he become the prototype, right? Is, can we draw a line of development from Brigham Young to Mussolini and then further? We probably can. And uh, take a look at this book, The uh, Fraternization of the Mormons with National Socialism is Heavy Duty. And you see this in the Deseret News of 1933. You see it in the uh, Der Stern, the Star, which is the Mormon publication in Germany under the Nazis. Uh, Roman Catholics, mainline Protestants, and Mormons were generally the only ones that the Nazis left alone, at least very late into the day. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists were slammed from the very beginning because they would not go along with oaths and they wouldn't serve in the military. So uh, all of these things and more, buy a copy, buy several copies, uh, get one for the person that you want to educate, get one for the person that you want to shake their, uh, whose who's, uh, blind devotion to Romney you wish to shake. Progressivepress.com, progressivepress.com, and the book is Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney's Mormon Takeover of the United States. Now, getting back to... The, uh, the question of this debate. Uh, what I put out on the Twitter, <laughs> which I stress again, uh, the liar and the coward. So Romney comes in there, and with his antinomian flexibility and pragmatism, as John Meacham would say, he gets to <coughs> change everything, right? I've been campaigning on a $5 trillion tax cut for the rich, but I, I don't have any $5 trillion tax cut for the rich. Now, at that point... The only possible uh, way out is for Obama to say, you're a liar, stop lying. Stop flip-flopping, stop lying, stop fibbing, stop prevaricating, however you're going to say it. Uh, and then, to go after him, maybe remember the points that are relevant on Romney? Uh, well, we should remember them, right? The uh, obvious one is the 47%. When Romney gets up there and says, I want to be the president of all the people, I'll never increase taxes on the middle class. Wait a minute, the 47%. And what does this show? How about Romney's overseas accounts in Luxembourg, Switzerland, the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, and other locations? He's got his own incorporated tax shelter in Bermuda. How about Bain Capital and their asset stripping, destroying lives, factories, and communities? How about your tax returns? 
How about outsourcing? How about sending the jobs to China? Obama punted on all of that. He's a coward. And why? We'll go through in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So here we have Obama de- debating Gordon Gecko, except it's a Gordon Gecko who pretends that he's reformed and says, I am not, I'm not in the business of giving a $5 trillion tax cut to my rich friends. How, how would I do that? So Obama's pathetic showing is that he doesn't bring up the 47%, the accounts, uh, the tax shelters, the tax dodging, the Bain capital assets stripping above all, the tax returns, the outsourcing of jobs to China, the whole question of economic globalization, and indeed the fact that you can't listen to anything Romney says because it is a flip-flopper and it changes. <clears throat> so... Um, where does that leave us? Why, why does Obama do this? Um, possible explanations. Uh, one is, and th- some of these are more charitable to Obama than others, one is that uh, as a black candidate, he's been told that you can't appear to be angry black man under any circumstances, therefore you've got to just take it. Uh, it sounds like the advice given to Jackie Robinson when he first uh, came into baseball with the Brooklyn Dodgers. The problem is... The world has changed since then, right? Things have, have uh, shifted, and, uh, you know, I think we've come relatively far down that road. M- more to the point, uh, Obama has also been told by his handlers that his electability depends on his likability, and he's got to be likable because if he, doesn't, if, he, if he gets involved in fights, if he starts calling Romney on his lies, then... Uh, he won't be likable anymore, and he'll lose these famous fussy independents, right, the 3 or 4% in the middle that they seem to be contending for, that seem to be the, the, uh, the, uh, the main force in U.S. politics. Uh, and then, of course, there's the idea that Obama is, as I've pointed out in two books, a Wall Street puppet, and he's got to uh, try, if he can, to ingratiate himself with Wall Street as much as he can, so he can't be seen as somebody waging a, uh, a struggle of any kind, right? Not on the 47%, not on Bain, not on asset stripping, not on uh, hedge fund hyenas, uh, leveraged buyouts, private equity, everything that Romney represents. So Obama's got to pull all of those punches, we're told. Uh, so there you have it. I mean, the, the main underlying thing is that Obama, his mental orientation is that he's already oriented towards the dirty deal which he's going to make in December to sell out his own base. He's preparing to stab his own base in the back with these sellouts on Social Security and entitlements. And he did say in the course of this debate that he supports now the Simpson Bowles. Well, we don't want Simpson Bowles. Simpson is this elderly uh, misanthrope, someone who hates humanity. He has a special hatred for retired people. He's a bubbling cauldron of hate, very, very nasty. Uh, and then Bowles, that was Clinton's guy, he's a Morgan Stanley zombie banker hedge fund hyena. We don't need a misanthrope and a hedge fund hyena to make economic policy. So uh, this defines this terrible situation. And now, as I say, in the background, we've got the Crapo Commission working with Crapo, Chambliss, Coburn, Alexander, Warner, Durbin, Bennett, and Conrad. And then we're told that there are four more, that we've got, we're up to almost a dozen on the Crapo line. And the idea here is massive cuts in entitlements and uh, symbolic nicks on, uh, on some of these uh, riches. In other words, the, 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 the thing you've always got to keep in mind, we're talking the necessities of the poor, the amenities of the middle class, and the luxuries of the super rich. And what we're being told is that the grand bargain means cutting deeply into the necessities of the poor and, indeed, cutting heavily into the amenities of the middle class, right? the, exchange, the occasional meal in a restaurant or a vacation or something like this. But the, the luxuries of the super rich will hardly be touched. It will be basically imperceptible. So the only way out of this is the united front against austerity. You've got to orient your thinking towards the creation of this united front. And that's October 27th, New York City, 56 Walker Street, uh, Tribeca, near the Canal Street uh, 
subway. And that will be, uh, I think, uh, an important uh, moment. I urge people to get there. Now, there are also these uh, third parties. Let me, let me point out that uh, there, is some, there are some glimmers on the uh, uh, questions of, uh, of economic program and, and related matters. This guy, um, Harold Meyerson, writes for the Washington Post. He's, he's the left wing, the left extremity of the Washington Post. And he talks about two things in a column this week. Number one is the Wall Street sales tax. He says he, this is his, his proposal for what the debate should talk about. He said it should talk about the transaction tax, the financial transaction tax. Harold, let's call it the Wall Street sales tax so everybody can figure out what this means. Uh, and it's not going to be paid by people who, who buy and sell for their own little 401k account or something like this. But it's the... Wall Street sales tax. So, usefully, Harold Meyerson said that should be debated. And the other one he wants to have debated is Glass-Steagall. And we're all for Glass-Steagall, except we're not in favor of using Glass-Steagall as the leading edge of agitation because it is a process reform which uh, does not immediately uh, impact the existential problems of the, of the uh, masses in the way that a ban on foreclosures, uh, an uh, open-ended 99 weeks plus, uh, to infinity, uh, unemployment benefits would do uh, an increase in the availability of food stamps. In other words, those are the immediate things that can serve as the the, the leading edge of uh, of agitation. And I'm, I will argue for that in the uh, at the United Front against uh, austerity. So there's that. And then uh, we also had uh, the Green Party. Now I, I I'm not putting my hand in the fire for anybody, but if you look at the Green Party. Here we have Jill Stein running for president, and we have Sherry Hunkala. Sherry Hunkala that we had on this broadcast a year ago when she was running for sheriff of Philadelphia. She had a, a, a mass traction demand. Her mass traction demand was, elect me sheriff of Philadelphia, and I will stop all foreclosures because I won't carry them out. I will refuse to execute foreclosures. You put me in there, you won't be thrown out of your house no matter what. And uh, unfortunately, the Democratic machine was powerful enough to simply uh, snow that under with their uh, demagogy. But now we have Jill Stein and Sherry Hunkala, Hunkala for uh, vice president. And Jill Stein has called for the Wall Street sales tax. She also calls it a, uh, a financial transfer tax, but she also calls it a sales tax for the financial community. Jill, Wall Street sales tax, Wall Street sales tax. Sherry, I hope also, Wall Street sales tax is the way to go. Now, she, the, uh, Jill Stein has the Green New Deal. Um, I can see what she's trying to get at, and anybody who says New Deal immediately gets sympathetic attention. The problem with that is the green part. And uh, if you look at the debate, Romney can throw at Obama saying, you're not picking winners and losers, you're picking losers, because you're putting this money into these green jobs, and this is, this is a failure. It's a historical failure. Don't we want to learn something from the failure of this green job stuff in the Obama administration? Does that show us anything about the nature of the world, the nature of technology, the nature of the market, and so forth? What it shows you is that these technologies need to be heavily subsidized, even more heavily subsidized than they were by the Obama administration. They are still anti-economical. Why are we throwing money down this rat hole? We've got to use proven, track-tested track methods of energy production and, uh, and not worry about the green job. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about some other, some other minor parties here and then uh, got to get to the Middle East in our last segment. Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley reporting from Washington, D.C., we're taping the program this week a little bit earlier. It's Thursday, October 25th, and the reason for the change is this weekend uh, will be taken up by the United Front Against Austerity, uh, the launch, the initial conference, for some the founding convention, for some a public assembly, but it will be a very interesting meeting, United Front Against Austerity. Now, by the time you hear this, uh, your main option is to proceed to tarpley.net, 
uh, and get the info about where it's being webcast. There will be a webcast, and there will be uh, a, an audio broadcast, I believe, on No Lies Radio. But check all of that. Look at my Twitter feed. Their Twitter feed will get you the most uh, up-to-date stuff, and I'll try to do some tweets during the conference. Uh, and uh, above all, Tarpley.net. Right? You, Tarpley.net would be your headquarters if you cannot attend, uh, as is likely. But, of course, if you're hearing this in the afternoon of Saturday and you're anywhere in the New York area, right, do, do, uh, do drop by. This will start at about noon. It is in the... Independent, the INN World Report Auditorium. The INN World Report Auditorium on Walker Street, 56 Walker Street, New York, New York, 10013. It's one and a half blocks south of Canal Street between Church and Broadway. So, starts at noon. Get there early. Uh, a contribution is uh, sincerely recommended let me give you the rundown of the uh of the speakers here uh let's see if i can get an updated list uh maybe i'll give you the speakers in the second uh segment because it's going to take me a minute the, the list is changing rapidly we've got some important uh, additions that uh that need to come in but the idea then is uh that we're going to have this uh united front against austerity it's going to be, I think, a, a monumental turning point event. So, uh, try if there's any way you can, uh, if you can be there, or if you can tune in. Now, this is one side of what we need to deal with today. We'll devote probably the first hour to that. The second hour, I want to give you, since this is the uh, the last full week before the presidential election, I want to give you the final summary of the case against Mitt Romney. Now, we have two books out uh, on Obama. We have Obama, the Postmodern Coup, The Making of a Manchurian Candidate. Really uncanny how that one tells you exactly what's going to happen in Obama's uh, current term in office. With color revolutions, a whole big chapter about color revolutions. And, of course, that's been the, the hallmark of the entire thing. What went on in Egypt, what went on in, in Tunisia, what was attempted in Iran, and so forth. These are color revolutions. So that, I think, called it. And we've got Barack H. Obama, the unauthorized biography. You get those from Progressive Press of California. But now we have this mysterious candidate whose ruling passion is secrecy. His election uh, program, his in intentions for his term in office, are as secret as the inside of a Mormon temple for the rest of us Gentiles, damned Americans, and unbelievers so it's a secret religion. I guess you can call it a mystery religion. He would be the first non-Christian president of the United States. And uh, I'm just appalled. I look at these, these people like Billy Graham, who claim to represent Christianity. What's clear to me is these people don't give a damn about Christianity. They're into power and money. And when, of course, you look at Ralph Reed, it's even more obvious. So they're willing to support somebody who's not a Christian, and they're not even willing to point out, or to explain, to justify, to motivate to their own gull-duped, pathetic followers, the so-called Christian evangelicals and social conservatives, value voters, that yes, he, he is not a Christian, but there are good reasons. They won't, they won't even do that. They're just trying to finesse the issue. Well, it's time to tell the entire story, and fortunately, I have. And that is just too weird just too weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon takeover of America, polygamy, theocracy, and subversion. And now, I think for the first time, I've got some printed copies here. I've got one in my hand, which I think is a very handsome and effective book. It's about 280 pages almost, a little bit less, 275 to 280. Bishop Romney and the Mormon takeover of America, polygamy, theocracy, and subversion. And here you get the real tradition of Romney, right? He says, I love my faith. Well, what is your faith? Oh, it's a secret. Well, you can't keep a secret uh, in, in today's world. And based on, what, 182 years of Mormon history, we can give you a pretty good idea. And as I'll try to motivate in the second part, when you see Romney's ability to lie, 
to prevaricate, his mendacity, his etch-a-sketch, his evasions, his distortions, his, uh, his uh, complete disregard for truth. You are dealing with lying raised to a theological principle. And I've tried to talk about this in the book uh, under the heading of antinomianism, that uh, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, Mitt Romney, the great trio now, we've got three of them, the triumviri of Mormonism, they uh, obviously believe that as saints, and uh, not just as saints, but as saints living in the end time, because of course it's always, it's always five minutes to midnight for these characters, they have the right to violate the moral law, right? Ten Commandments doesn't make any difference. You can lie, you can bear false witness, uh, as you're probably commanded to. So this is now the Mormon moment, and if you don't know what the White Horse prophecy is, if you don't know what the Oath of Obedience is, if you don't know what the Oath of Vengeance is, you're buying a pig in a poke, and you better not do that. So you better get your copy of Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney, and the Mormon Takeover of America. For this, you need to go to ProgressivePress.com. ProgressivePress.com. And what you find there is you can buy the printed copy, which I highly recommend. It's a handsome book. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's an interesting addition to, uh, to any uh, personal library. But if uh, that takes too long or too expensive, fine. We have a $6 offer on a, an e-book. So $6, I think, puts it uh, within the reach of the broadest masses. Uh, so rather than uh, spend time reading the Voter's Guide of the League of Women Voters, you should get yourself a copy of Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America, Polygamy, Theocracy, and Subversion. <clears throat> and, of course, Halloween is upon us, right? So um, we should remember that the entire Twilight Saga, this um, cycle, uh, the trilogy, I guess it is, or tetralogy of trashy novels about... Uh, what can we call it, a woman practicing abstinence, but uh, surrounded by an aristocratic vampire and a somewhat more down-to-earth or even, uh, what can we say, uh, more, more populist werewolf. This uh, woman is a Mormon, and according to some articles that I've read, I, I must confess I'm not really a student of the, of the Twilight Saga, but according to some students of, uh, of her work, that is a, uh, an allegory of Mormonism. So uh, watch out. And these are, these are subtle ways in which uh, this will be uh, projected. And wait till you have Romney in the White House, and he wants to go to, uh, to the Mormon Temple, which is located up here uh, on Georgia Avenue, or a little bit off Georgia Avenue in Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside the Beltway. As I've said before, it towers over the Beltway. When you're driving... Driving west on the Beltway after Georgia Avenue, you see this immense structure looming. It seems like it's looming right over the Beltway. And uh, that's the Mormon Temple. And when Romney goes there on Sunday, uh, nobody can go with him. It's a secret. And what did you do at Temple today, uh, Bishop? It's a secret. Well, if you want that kind of a presidency, uh, that's where we're headed. So uh, time to do something about it. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So two burning issues of our time. Get yourself a copy of Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America with Polygamy, Theocracy, and Subversion. Get it now from Progressive Press of California. Go to progressivepress.com. And uh, paper copy, I think a very handsome edition, wonderful work by John Leonard. And then uh, the e-book, a mere $6.00. The price of a of a magazine, you can even you can pay six dollars for certain newspapers. So uh, you can pay that. It's a it's a one Starbucks, right? It's a venti <laughs> venti. Uh, now, the other thing, of course, Saturday, October twenty seventh, United Front Against Austerity. I've given you the overview. Check uh, tarpley dot net for all details. Tarpley dot net will also give you my political report to the UFAA conference and we've just been hearing if you look at today's washington post of thursday october 25th it's all confirmed obama is planning to sell you out uh, it's really um, reckless what he does 
but he's he's telling you that he wants to stab you in the back after appealing you to to you for your vote against the uh, the Wall Street asset stripper Romney. <laughs> he's going to turn around and do Wall Street's work under his uh, what is uh, somewhat frayed, but still some left cover or something like this. Now let's look at Romney. I guess we're we're not going to have as much time as I'd hoped for this. We got two segments, so let's do what we can. And then we'll probably devote the next uh, program entirely to the rundown against uh, Romney. A couple of strategic considerations, first of all. As you hear, we are not uh, uh, advocating, I'm not advocating any kind of lesser evil. I am saying against Obama, against Romney, united front against austerity. That's my vehicle. However, we also have to consider some other things. Let's talk about divided government. Uh, if Romney wins, he is likely, given these dynamics, to carry with him not just the House but the Senate. We would then be back to one-party rule, and that is a nightmare. The last time we had Republican one-party rule was at the beginning of the Bush administration, and the result was, well, 9-11 the Afghan war, and the Iraq war. They all go back to the period of Mad Dog Bush and the Republicans controlling both houses. You must vote in such a way as to preserve divided government. That, I think, is a reasonable policy goal. Do you want a regime of Romney, Boner, and McConnell? That doesn't look too good, and uh, I think that's worth uh, avoiding. The other question is the, is the party realignment. Uh, obviously, Karl Rove wants to have a 40-year permanent Republican majority. He wants to have a permanent austerity dictatorship. We've gone through how that would work. It would work on voter suppression. It would work on voter ID. Uh, it would work on closing the polls. It would work on denying the early voting and other uh, absentee ballots. It would work through massive purges of names from the electoral rolls, harassment of voters, and so forth. It also works through the Citizens United decision with the massive influx of uh, dirty money from uh, oligarchs. And, of course, the Supreme Court, uh, if Romney can get in now, he'll name one or two Supreme Court justices. They will be reactionaries, and uh, then we will be locked into a trajectory towards fascist dictatorship, uh, of the, through the Republican Party, although with the, obviously, security apparatus looming larger and larger. It's much harder to do the fascist austerity dictatorship through the Democratic Party because, again, it does have this character of an extremely diffuse uh, confederation of these identity politics agitational groups. So the Republican attempt is to seize control of the federal government now because they feel that four years from now, and inevitably as time goes on, they will get weaker and weaker demographically because their uh, white male voter is in decline compared to Hispanic voters and quite a few others. So if they don't grab power now, they may never get another chance. So what we're really talking about is the theme that I've addressed in the past, which is the question of the, re the party realignment in the Electoral College, right? You'll remember we have these cycles in American history. We had the New Deal cycle from 1932 to 1968. That was dominated by the New Deal Democratic Party. This is the best uh, government that we've had, of course, with monstrous exceptions like Harry Truman. We had Wall Street Democrats sneaking in there, too. Uh, but uh, it came to more or less to fruition under Eisenhower. That led us to what most people would call the good old days. Don't forget it was full of racism. But still, uh, for many, uh, for many right wingers, they look back to Eisenhower. Well, that's uh, the New Deal under Republican uh, administration. Since then, though, we've had the Republican dominance right through the Southern strategy, 1968 to well, until now, right, 2008. If 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 uh, if Obama stays in office, it will be then a 40-year Republican cycle from 1968 to 2008 dominated again by the racist Southern strategy, right, with reactionary uh, predominance, and the big exception being Clinton uh, in the middle of it. Uh, if we had a realignment of the Electoral College uh, in favor of the Democratic Party, 
And the Republican Party, I think at that point, given these demographic trends, would tend to dwindle to a regional party of racists and reactionaries concentrated in the southern states. If the Republican Party were to atrophy as a national party, we could then get what we're really talking about in this program, which is a split of the Democratic Party between the Wall Street wing, people like Obama and Schumer and others, and then leftists. Some of these are also unfavorable, unsavory characters. But when you hear Bernie Sanders, when you hear DeFazio, when you hear Marcy Captor, that's different. It's uh, not adequate, but it is different, and that could be the basis of a split. So it seems to me that the more desirable of these outcomes is that the Republicans dwindle to what they really are, this racist regional party, the Democrats then split into the Wall Street Democrats, led by people like Obama, Kerry, and uh, the mi- current minority of the, re- of the Democratic Party, which is the, the, the ones that, that have some relation to the New Deal. Obviously, not, good, not a good situation. Don't blame me. I told you ways to avoid it uh, in useful time repeatedly. One way to get out of this was don't put Obama in as the Democratic candidate in 2008. I wrote two books to try to stop that, and it didn't work. But don't blame me. Blame others. So there there we have this. Now, the problem with Romney, the, unfortunately, one of the effects of the pathetic weakness of Obama, right? You saw Obama in the first debate. That's the real Obama. Cowardly, evasive, refuses to fight. Obama has also refused to uh, make an issue of this Mormon question, because this is a huge thing. Here we have a religious organization, which is actually a political faction. And what are their hallmarks? Well, contempt of women, as reflected through polygamy, right? reducing women to subordination and despair, this is simply devastating and destructive for modern society. The The consequences for the individual are horrendous for the individual woman. But remember, the barometer of the treatment of women is, is one of the ways you can judge the progress of a society. So what it means is a monstrous degradation of the entire society. We can't have this. Uh, if you uh, put Romney in the White House, you will have not just uh, Colorado City, Arizona, and Hilldale, Utah, but the polygs out there in the Great Basin are going to go wild because nobody will interfere with them. Right? We know Orrin Hatch, Senator Lee, Others, Michael Levitt, they, they're all willing to tolerate uh, polygamy. And they're getting help from people like uh, Turley here at George Washington University who take a libertarian approach to polygamy. They're kind of like John Stuart Mill of the British East India Company. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Now let's just uh, start which w- the process which I will then uh, devote the entire next program to the program that comes on the Saturday before the presidential election will be the uh, summary of the contents of Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America, Polygamy, Theocracy, and Subversion. And this is designed to spur you on to buy your own copy. Get it from Progressive Press, progressivepress.com. Paper copy, I think, looks great. And uh, e-book, as little as $6. Let's uh, just go through here. Uh, the preface. Um, we have a quote from uh, E.J. Dion, a right-winger friend of his, called him after the 47% rant by Romney to a bunch of rich money bags. After this was published, the uh, friend of uh, E.J. Dion of the Washington Post called him up and said, if I were you, I'd wonder why Romney hates America so much. Hates America so much, hates the American people, I would say. This is not what you want for the presidency. And my proposal is one factor, and an important one, is the traditional Mormon narrative of persecution, resentment, and revenge. And remember, we're talking about something that was not a peripheral aspect. It was not in some dusty book but it was an integral, salient part of the liturgy, the divine service, right? the, the uh, temple endowment, as they call it. What we call in Christianity the liturgy, they call 
outside of Christianity, the endowment, right? It's a Freemasonic concept. You get the idea. But the Mormon oath of vengeance against the United States, imposed by Brigham Young in the mid-1840s, after the killing of Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith, which is, the, the killing is still, I think, to some degree mysterious, because he was in the middle of running for president in 1844. He wanted to, obviously, he was being used or wanted himself to block the presidency of Henry Clay. This was one of the last chances to avoid the Civil War. Henry Clay had been elected president in 1844. Henry Clay is literally Mr. American System. That's his platform. The American system, meaning a national bank, meaning internal improvements paid for by the federal government. And it doesn't matter whether they're only in one state, if they're of national interest. And then uh, the uh, protective tariff to promote industrialization. So obviously, Joseph Smith in 1844, with his bombastic declarations, he created the Council of Fifty to seize political power. He was made king of the kingdom of God. His megalomania was in the ascendant. But somebody apparently decided that um, he wouldn't be allowed to, uh, to play this out. Anyway, that's the, the, the prologue to what Brigham Young then did. Once Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith had been killed, Brigham Young comes along and says, I'm inserting into the liturgy of the Mormon church. Every time you go to the temple, you're going to recite the oath of vengeance, which is, I promise to exact revenge from the United States of America and the American people for the death of the prophets, Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith. That was repeated in every liturgy in every Mormon temple until the late 1920s, meaning that George Romney, our affable governor of Michigan, I remember once seeing him, uh, American Motors used to be the sponsor of Disneyland, and uh, he would come out with the new models, and show you these glistening uh, cars in the Disneyland showroom there. So uh, he, George Romney, the governor of Michigan, who ran for president in 1968, would have recited the oath of vengeance against the United States repeatedly until it was finally phased out in the late 1920s as part of what they call the good neighbor policy. The good neighbor policy is that they would, the Mormons would de-emphasize their hostility and hatred against the United States because it, uh, it was obviously hurting them. So we want to know about that. And if George Romney swore it, he also swore that he would teach it to his progeny down to the fourth generation. Well, if it starts from George, I don't know whether we count George or not. If we count George, it's George, Mitt, Tag, and Tag's children are all sworn to the oath of vengeance. If George doesn't count, then it starts with Mitt, Tag, the kids, and their kids have all sworn, are all bound by the oath of vengeance sworn by George Romney. Do you want such a person in the White House? The narrative of persecution and revenge. And of course, the idea that you could have blood revenge, human sacrifice is what it means. Human sacrifice is demanded by Brigham Young. He builds that into the liturgy as well. It's called blood atonement. The terrible things done by the American people to Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith cannot be forgiven by God unless the people involved are killed with bloodshed. That's uh, the doctrine. So if they say uh, polygamy is part of religious freedom, the answer is no. But if you accept that polygamy is part of religious freedom, then the next one is human sacrifice is part of religious freedom. And it's not theoretical. This is a demand from Brigham Young, blood atonement and the oath of vengeance against the United States. So uh, Dinesh D'Souza, who just, he just got caught with a paramour in a hotel room and has lost his job at King's College, uh, you can see that when you get into this Mormon orbit, uh, the, the marriage institution it comes under tremendous stress. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza has argued in his uh, film 2016, you've got to look at Obama's father, anti-imperialism. 
and all the terrible things that go with this. So what I I'm the poor man's 2016. I'm telling you just too weird what Romney would do. So I've done Obama. I've told you everything about Obama that's relevant. I now I'm taking you back to Parley Pratt, the uh, one of the co-founders of Mormonism, along with Joseph Smith, back in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. Time magazine in their profile called Romney a typical Mormon pragmatist. Well, pragmatist, <laughs> it, what it means is what you've seen now. Liar, prevaricator, etch-a-sketch, flip-flop. Uh, so again, you don't know what you're getting, but with my book you do know what you're getting. You're getting the Mormon tradition, and believe me, it's ugly. Anti-woman, it's anti-black racism. You could not be a full-fledged member of the church if you were black from the time that this uh, popped into Joseph Smith's head, sometime between 1830 and 1840, the door was closed. It remained closed until 1978. So all the people who have joined, the families that have traditionally been part of the church, joined something that was a Jim Crow white supremacist religion. And if you want to know where those ideas come from in the Intermountain West, you don't have to look very far. Now, the unique feature of my book in addition to giving you the panorama of what Brigham Young did to secede from the United States and start America's first civil war in 1857 to 1858. This is, of course, the incident where the president of the United States, James Buchanan, bad guy, but still, here it is, the first time an American president talks about terrorism is James Buchanan warning of a strange system of terrorism which has grown up in the Utah Territory under the theocratic dictatorship of Brigham Young. So this is the Mormon Rebellion in Utah Territory, 1857 to 1858, including the Mountain Meadows Massacre, which is part of the glue that holds the Romney campaign together. Every principle in the campaign is implicated. But the unique feature of my book is that it shows the entire thing is promoted and made possible by the British East India Company, the British Foreign Office, as shown through figures like John Stuart Mill, supporting Mormonism in On Liberty, Thomas Carlyle's unpublished essay in favor of the Mormons, and other top British oligarchs. It's parallel to synthetic religions in China with the Taiping Rebellion, in the British creation of what is called Hinduism, and indeed the uh, Wahhabite and Salafi tendencies in the Middle East. All of these are fostered by British intelligence at that time located in the British East India Company. So that's my unique uh, contribution, I would say. So we'll go through all this in detail next week. CNN, World Crisis Radio, we'll be back next week. Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. This is our last broadcast before the U.S. presidential election. We're recording right now on the afternoon of Friday, November 2nd. It's uh, All Souls. Yesterday was All Saints. Um, Time to think about posterity. And uh, time to get a copy of... Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America with Polygamy, Theocracy, and Subversion. That's available at ProgressivePress.com, ProgressivePress.com. Get a copy now. Ebook available for as little as $6. Go for it while there's still time. Uh, educate people. You don't want to test this out uh, in, uh, on your own flesh. We've had some uh, interesting events this week. Um, and there's an interview with Maria Heller, uh, a very uh, influential commentator on the radio. Uh, she's a very influential reviewer on Amazon. She's been very kind to this book, regards it as the one must read before the presidential election. You can find that at Maria's website, and it'll be up at tarpley.net. By the time you hear this, it will be up. So thank you to Maria Heller. And we also had our event at the National Press Club on uh, Wednesday evening, on Halloween. We had the McClendon Group, founded by Sarah McClendon, the late Sarah McClendon, 
uh, and still going strong. And a packed McLendon room was the uh, was the outcome of this. And uh, very interesting discussion. And we even had a Mormon present. Somebody, I don't know who he was. He said he was a Mormon historian who came there by chance. <laughs> yes, by chance. I'm sure. Just happened to be there. Came from Salt Lake City by chance. Uh, he uh, he objected to what I was saying, and he gave the usual lame excuse that polygamy was uh, a response to depopulation, right, because of the atrocities of the damned Americans. And, of course, uh, this doesn't hold water, because there were always more men than women in the uh, Mormon community. So instituting polygamy simply meant condemning a large part of the male population to a bachelorhood, meaning you can't get really into heaven. You, if you're not married, you, you get uh, neutered when you arrive, uh, and then you can be in heaven but as a servant. But he, uh, he put up the usual Mormon line on that. Mountain Meadows Massacre, this was asked by one of the participants in the, uh, in the debate, and on the Mountain Meadows Massacre, the story was that it was uh, a couple of Mormons got dressed up as Indians and decided to kill all the people from Arkansas, because uh, in Missouri, some of those same people had taken part in harassing and, and killing the Mormons, uh, what, 15 years earlier? It's, it's from 18, it's pra- practically a decade, right? It's, it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's 20 years. It's from 1837 to uh, 1857, so it's 20 years earlier. Notice this constant obsession with revenge and killing an armed force, which... Uh, of course, in Christianity, whatever it looks like in practice, in theory, it can have no, it can have no, uh, no, no weight. So this guy looked for all the world like Joel Skousen. I don't know where Joel Skousen was that night, but this guy sure looked like him with a bald head and glasses, and he said he was a Mormon historian. So that was a highly interesting discussion. That tape, we're fortunate that uh, it was taped, and that will also be up at tarpley.net if you want to see what went down at the National Press Club on Wednesday evening. And the bottom line is, get your copy of Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America. Just too weird, the Bishop, uh, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America with polygamy, theocracy, and subversion. And, of course, racism. Let's not forget that. If you're a woman, it's polygamy. If you're black or brown, it's racism. The sons of Ham don't get in. And if you're a Lamanite, much harder to get in. So uh, we're thinking under Romney, the coins may say, in Elohim we trust. No more in God we trust. It'll be in Elohim we trust. And it'll be in the oath, uh, so help me Elohim. And if it's not clear who that is, it's Elohim of Kolob, I guess the ruler of, of, of at least this part of the universe, although not... Not of the whole thing, because that, uh, that would be um, authoritarian. So, uh, and of course the system is oligarchical. The uh, ele- election is now upon us, and we'll talk to you about the, the various considerations in this election. But let's, uh, let's look first at the, at the hurricane. I was then in New York, right? We had the uh, United Front Against Austerity meeting last, Saturday in New York City. I'll give you a detailed report about that later in the program. Very successful. Many organizations represented. We hope very much in the course of this program to give you a report from one of the main participants in this United Front effort, and that is Reverend Edward Pinckney of Benton Harbor, Michigan, who is in the front line. He is in the trenches, in the front line of the trenches, fighting the fascist Governor Snyder of Michigan and his emergency manager law, and fighting the idea of sending these dictators, these little Hitlers, who are sent to run Benton Harbor, Flint, Pontiac, Ecos, Detroit school system, and they'd be in Detroit already, except that the Detroit mayor and city council allowed this to happen uh, really behind the scenes. So... If you're in Michigan, vote, 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 vote yes on statewide proposals A and B. Statewide proposal A, 
Should there be a referendum on the emergency manager law? Yes, yes, yes. Should there, on pro- proposal B, should there be a right to collective bargaining in the state of Michigan? Yes, yes, yes. This is worth more than just about any other vote. Uh, if, if, certainly if you're in Michigan, this is the vote that, that, uh, that, that counts for sure, because this is one vote where the Democratic Party is not getting in the way. It's a little bit like Ohio last year, right, when Ohio was asked, uh, should the anti-union, union-busting measures of the fascist Kasich be rolled back? The answer to that was yes, uh, resounding yes. And Kasich received a decisive rebuff, and he was shaken. But, of course, he's come back with his uh, lunatic ideology uh, since uh, he got an infusion of uh, money, or was it formaldehyde, to, to, uh, to stiffen his backbone. So, uh, in the case of Michigan, there's every reason to think that these initiatives can work, because you won't have somebody like, uh, like Mayor Barrett of Milwaukee getting in the way, uh, uh, a treacherous sleazy Democratic hack Paul coming out as the candidate after all that work. So Michigan is one of the key things. Watch Michigan on Tuesday evening. And above all, in the meantime, get the word out. Get the Twitter army going. We need a Twitter barrage. Twitter barrage in favor of Michigan. Vote yes on statewide proposals A and B. Fight fascism in Michigan. And this is very direct because you'll recall the coup d'etat in Prussia of July 1932, where the social democratic regime is ousted by von Papen by now. Von Papen, this is after Berlin. Von Papen sets up an austerity dictatorship in Prussia. This is now the tendency. So if it can happen in Benton Harbor and these other places, it can happen in Michigan. If it happens in Michigan, it can happen in the United States. That's the path to dictatorship. Notice our dear friends, our wonderful heroes, the libertarians, they can't see this coming. They're focused on what happens with the TSA in the airport or some other drama of our time, rather than seeing the concrete jackboots of fascism marching in Michigan, step by step, out in the open, very public, and no, no way to, to mistake what's going on there. So we'll get to Reverend Pinckney in a minute but now we're gonna we'll, we're gonna talk about Benghazi and the CIA Mormon Mafia back in a minute welcome back to World Crisis Radio get your copy of Just Too Weird Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America Polygamy Theocracy and Subversion get it from ProgressivePress.com ProgressivePress.com Palm Desert California and it'll be on its way and it can be in your hands within uh, hours or minutes with the electronic ebook, which you can get for a mere six dollars, the price of a latte. How can you not have this? It's a tragedy not to have this for six measly Rasputniks. So now uh, the Benghazi story. This is a, a big, a big news this morning, and it, it's interesting in itself. It's important in itself, and it's also important because all the CIA supporters are coming out of the woodwork to agitate now for Romney. People who are coming out of the woodwork now to agitate for Romney uh, are uh, showing their true colors. Now, the orientation we have here is a plague on both your houses. Stop Romney, stop Obama, do it with the united front against austerity. Who should you vote for? You should support Proposition A and B, statewide proposal A and B in Michigan. There are a couple of others. I'll give you suggestions on protest votes for the presidential campaign later on. But uh, no, no to both of them. And I am always appalled by the really stupid American attitude towards elections. It's not like getting married. It's not a declaration of principle. You don't have to regard it as a choice of world outlook. It's purely tactical. It's an area of grave corruption, and you can certainly say a plague on both your houses and then look around for some protest candidate who, uh, who gives you some bang for the buck. And uh, let me just anticipate who it might be. Uh, you look at these um, third-party candidates. Who do we have? Jill Stein of the Green Party. <laughs> well, not so great. 
We have um, Rocky Anderson of the Justice Party. This is a thinly veiled Mormon attempt to suck uh, votes away from Obama and help, help Romney in some states. Gary Johnson, the Libertarian Party. This is essentially Ron Paul, genocidal austerity against the American people, absolutely to be rejected. And then we have Virgil Goode, uh, who is also a, uh, well, he may qualify, I guess, as a, well, uh, he's strong in uh, southeast Virginia, sorry, southwest Virginia, and he might have some effect in hurting Romney in, in Virginia. But none of these is acceptable. The one person in this entire array who has shown some character, and this is not in the way of, a, of an endorsement of anybody's program, Sherry Honkalot, you heard here on uh, uh, on this this program about a year ago, she was running for sheriff of Philadelphia, and she showed some guts. She showed some fighting spirit. Sherry Hunkala said, "Elect me sheriff of Philadelphia, and there won't be any more foreclosures because I will refuse to carry them out." There's an example of fighting spirit and true populism and true concern for the masses that I haven't seen from any of these others. So, if you want to have a sentimental favorite, maybe it ought to be. Sherry Hunkel, a vice presidential candidate for the Green Party. Unfortunately, there you have to hold your nose uh, with, the, uh, with the other people uh, on that uh, ticket. And, of course, this does not endorse the Malthusianism and the anti-science, anti-technology, and pro-green jobs flim-flam of the, of the Green Party. Uh, there's also Roseanne Barr and, uh, and um, uh, her running mate, who um, appeared, uh, Cindy Sheehan, at the United Front against austerity that's i guess in some places that might might be of interest to some but again i the one person who's actually done something in the right direction in the crisis sherry hunkala so think about her uh but other than that uh this is uh this is obviously only a protest vote in other words it's the, the negative features of the program don't matter so much as the opportunity to register a protest vote so in some areas you can you can do that now, um, let's, look at, uh, let's look at Benghazi. And you know the answer to this already. The CIA Mormon Mafia. Any analysis of Benghazi that doesn't start, middle, and end with CIA Mormon Mafia is a cover-up. Now, you know the basic outlines. The film, the film is important. Yes, indeed. The film caused demonstrations in Egypt and Pakistan in 25 cities all around the world, 25 countries, I guess it must be, uh, and created the atmosphere in which this uh, stunt could be pulled off. And that's done by the Islamophobia Network, by Nasrallah, leading to the Islamophobia Group, and then to Bolton, Bolton, likely Secretary of State for Romney. So that's one side of it. And we've talked about Kumu coming out of Guantanamo Bay, obvious U.S. double agent, obvious CIA asset, killing the ambassador with his group. The ambassador, of course, was there, unfortunately, to negotiate fighters and weapons from these al-Qaeda groups in the Benghazi, Derna, Tobruk terror axis that I warned you about a year and a half ago and more. Uh, that's what he was doing. He didn't think there was any threat to him because these are the people he'd been dealing with. He'd been uh, paying them. They, don't, they were also buying weapons, I suppose. That's, the, that's another cover story. Uh, the, co the cover story from David Ignatius on the radio this morning that uh, Ambassador Stevens was there to open a library is, is uh, laughable in the extreme. It was the, a library of Kalashnikovs that he was opening up one way or another. So he was, he was there. Uh, and then the people that were supposed to provide security. Well, one was the, the February 17th Martyrs Brigade, the CIA asset, which they had used to kill... General Yunus to secure the victory of their their favorite General Hifter or Hafter as head of the Libyan forces. So he they had done yeoman service for the CIA. But now that CIA annex that the Mormon Congressman Chaffetz was so worried about uh, showing in those hearings a couple of weeks ago, where he freaked out and wanted the State Department to take down the overhead picture, which came from uh, commercial images like Google Earth or whatever it was, this uh, CIA uh, station and their failure to intervene has been uh, prominent 
in the news coverage. Now, the way this started was on October 26th. We have Jennifer Griffin of Fox News, of all places, writes an exclusive. CIA operators were denied requests for help during Benghazi attack, sources say. And she says, Fox News has learned from sources who were on the ground in Benghazi that an urgent request from the CIA annex for military backup during the attack on the U.S. consulate and subsequent attacks several hours later on the annex itself was denied by the CIA chain of command. Denied by the CIA chain of command. Not the White House, not even Hillary Clinton, the CIA chain of command, who also told the CIA operators twice to stand down rather than help the ambassador's team. More in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Go back to World Crisis Radio. Get your copy of Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America with Polygamy, Theocracy, and Subversion. So... Back on uh, October 26th, we have Jennifer Griffin of Fox News reporting that the CIA chain of command denied the Benghazi consulate, and it's it's really emerging as more of a CIA office, a CIA consulate than a State Department consulate. Uh, The uh, CIA chain of command denied permission to this CIA team, which is up to 12 people. These are special forces. These are uh, the tough guys. Uh, The CIA chain of command says no, and told the CIA operatives to stand down rather than help the ambassador's team (coughs) when shots were heard at approximately 9.40 p.m. on uh, September 11th. So it's really only Fox News that pushes this, and they push it because they think they're helping Romney. But now the difference is, uh, uh, sorry, David Ignatius, David Ignatius here in the Washington Post, November 1st. Uh, the attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi is a political football, but Jennifer Griffin of Fox News has raised important questions that uh, the CIA officers in Benghazi had been told to stand down when they wanted to deploy from their base at the annex to repel the attack on the consulate. And that then leads today, the news of today, November 2nd, is uh, now we're on the front page of today's Washington Post. We're told that the CIA has published a timeline. The CIA timeline says that uh, help was on the way to the beleaguered consulate within 25 minutes. Well, uh, this is a lot of uh, baloney. This is a cover-up, and it's a cover-up for the CIA Mormon Mafia. What Jennifer Griffin has stumbled on, mark my words, Jennifer Griffin has stumbled on a true story. She doesn't understand what she's dealing with. This is, these are not orders coming from Obama. This is ridiculous. It's the CIA Mormon Mafia in the CIA chain of command that issued the stand-down order for exactly the reason that I told you within the first few days after the attack. To get an October surprise, already in September, and to use that to carterize Obama. Now, it's not working. You can see how angry these reactionaries are that this does not have traction, uh, partly because the, the economic situation is so desperate. People simply do not have time and energy for issues other than their own survival. But you get the idea with this. Uh, it is the CIA Mormon Mafia. Now, we're, we've also got the subsidiary story that um, Tyrone Woods, former Navy SEAL, was killed in the process. And his father has made some very intemperate uh, statements. So, of course, he's a bereaved uh, father uh, on Fox News, of course, talking to Sean Hannity. Who else? Charles Woods, the father of the slain CIA contractor, says uh, that the people who... He says White House officials, well, it's not White House officials, who, decl- who ordered uh, no help for the embattled CIA annex. They were cowards, and they're guilty of murdering my son. Well, I'm afraid if you want to blame somebody, you've got to blame J- General David Petraeus. General David Petraeus, the head of the CIA, has ministerial responsibility. So you want to get somebody, get General David Petraeus. He's responsible. 
and if you want to take it to the State Department side, it is indeed Hillary Clinton. There is ministerial responsibility. Something goes wrong in your ministry, you are out, not the head of government or the head of state. But now, this is the point at which all the pro-Romney forces are attempting to mobilize Fox News, Hannity, but also LaRouche, the amen corner of the CIA. He's going to be at the press club today, we're told, uh, trying to sell the version that Obama is personally micromanaging everybody in, uh, in Benghazi. Now, of course, it's a funny story, because on the one side they say, he doesn't care, he's off campaigning, and the other side is, he micromanages everything. Well, which is it? Glenn Beck, another well-known Mormon activist, a, a strident apologist for Mormonism, if there ever was one. You can read about a couple of things about him in my book, Bishop Romney, Just Too Weird. Uh, Glenn Beck uh, says that he's got some secret document that will prove that Obama is the one who did it. In the meantime, Glenn Beck is, is shouting that the Western way of life, Western civilization, is at stake in this election. Yes, in order to save Western civilization, we've got to put in a candidate who comes from a tradition of polygamy and theocracy and racism and secessionism. Just what we need. And, of course, antinomianism. If we're going to count the heresies, the antinomian heresy, no laws, do what you want. The Pelagian heresy, that uh, you, you make your own destiny, there's no role for... Uh, for grace or divine providence, nothing like this. In religion, this is an important concept. And the Arian heresy, which is that uh, Christ is just a guy like you. <laughs> or, I mean, God is just it's an ultra, ultra Arian uh, heresy. And we're told by Glenn Beck that if Romney is not elected, the world will weep. Well, you look at the polls in Europe, of course, the, the world doesn't seem to be weeping for Romney. Also, we've got Joel Skousen, an uh, eminent uh, Mormon activist, telling us that uh, Romney is not part of the establishment. Romney is not a conspirator. Romney is a maverick. He's potential trouble for those guys. He's smart. He is like Ronald Reagan. He has principles. He's very ambitious. He won't be controllable by them. Uh, this, of course, is uh, extremely dubious as, a, uh, as an analysis. Uh, and we've got a whole bunch of, uh, of, of well, uh, people who are, uh, they're still focused on Obama. Uh, they're really only four years behind now, right? They were, they were focused on Bush when Obama came along, and now that Romney comes along, they're still focused on, uh, on Obama. Um, so uh, th this is the, uh, the situation. I think... If you look at Glenn Beck, Glenn Beck is the face of, of, of Mormon political activism. That, that, is, that is what the Mormon hierarchy actually thinks. The Mormon hierarchy that gave you Ezra Taft Benson, who said that Martin Luther King was a communist, civil rights was communism, and, uh, and it was time to, uh, to, uh, to get rid of all of those uh, people. Now, th this is the, the immediate uh, focus. So... The, this entire operation depends on the cowardice of the Obama White House. If the Obama White House had the guts to send people out, and they could do this through cutouts, to say CIA Mormon Mafia, that would blow the lid off this thing. It's only the, the stubborn silence, the prevarication of the Obama White House that lets this uh, go on. Now, in line with this, uh, let's, do, let's do a couple of other foreign policy um, items before we go uh, further, uh, the Syrian government, uh, it, there's going to be a uh, conference in Qatar next week where the State Department and the CIA are going to present their new puppet council for Syria. Remember the Iraqi government in a box? <laughs> now we have the Syrian government in exile in a box. A new puppet council, and Hillary Clinton, traveling in the Balkans, says that the difference of the new puppet council compared to the old Puppet Council, which was the Syrian National Council. That is being junked because of their squabbles. She says it's time for a new Puppet Council in which the fighters, the killers, the death squads, have more representation. And as some people have commented with some irony, the State Department is now looking high and low 
for fighters who are also pro-democracy, liberal uh, activists. It's a complete fraud. Ambassador Ford, the uh, expert in uh, these matters when it comes to uh, death squads, very knowledgeable, he's going to be present in Qatar next week, so they're going to launch that. It's a sign of desperation, as I had occasion to point out. Back in a minute.